Hello, um, welcome back um, everybody. I hope you all feel refreshed. Um, I thought that was a really good um, panel session, just chatting to some of you guys in the breakout areas. Um, I think people generally found it useful, so hopefully um, our second panel should live up to that, and I think it will with the speakers we've got on here. So this session's um, called From Strategy to Workforce, Preparing Your Business for the Future. So we're going to dig into some of those issues around your strategy, tech, and also how the workforce of the future might affect the way you work as a law firm. So um, let me introduce our panellists. First off, we've got Mary Bonsall, who's CEO of Eflex. Um, Mary took the plunge a few years ago, I think you worked in a city firm, but took the plunge to set up um, Eflex, which is a, a sort of way of using a technology platform to source paralegals on a very quick basis for law firms. And it really is really interesting to hear her insights around what the lawyers of tomorrow might look like, because you're dealing with lots of those through your business. Um, secondly, we've got um, Richard Troman, so understand... Um, lived in Birmingham, or grew up in Birmingham, um, for a bit, but he's been in the legal sector for over two decades now. He's an editor of Artificial Lawyer and is one of the leading authorities on sort of the implications of tech and AI in the legal sector. Then next along, we've got Michelle Tunney, um, who's Apprenticeship Manager at BCLP. Um, she's, I think, got 16 years' experience in the legal sector. Of she's leading... Um, on uh, that, their firm's apprenticeship programme, and I'll be really interested to hear some of her views around are apprenticeships just a sort of PR exercise, or is, it, is there a tangible business benefit that offers a real opportunity for firms? And then um, at the end of the row, we've got Mark Edwards, who's Senior Vice President at Rocket Lawyer. Um, for those who don't know Rocket Lawyer, it's um, not actually an SRA regulated firm, which is an interesting issue in itself, particularly as our reforms mean that solicitors may be able to, will be able to work in those type of, type of firms coming in. And obviously, Rocket Lawyer is about opening up access to easy legal services, and Mark has a lot of experience in customer, customer insight and using tech in the legal sector. So there we go with the um, introductions. We're going to run this panel uh, in a similar way to the last one. People are going to give a bit of an opening statement to a question I'm going to ask, but I want to try and get out to the floor as quickly as possible. So get those questions ready. Just one final thing, um, and thank you to the gentleman who pointed this out to me. The Wi-Fi address has actually got an extra S in it on the agenda. I think the password is customer first rather than customers first. So if you've had problems getting on the Wi-Fi, that might be the reason. So apologies for, for that. Um, so let's start. The question I wanted to ask our panellists just to say two or three minutes on as an opening statement was, in terms of you preparing your business for the future, what, what would your advice be to a law firm or to a lawyer? And Mark, could we start with you? Okay, I'll kick off. Um, as Richard pointed out, I'm the scruffy tech person. Um, so apologies, I haven't got a suit on today. Um, so I am Mark Edwards, and I um, look after the UK business for Rocket Lawyer, and I also lead on our global innovation. So let me just talk a little bit about who Rocket Lawyer are, just so you've got a bit more background on us. Um, we are an online legal services company. Um, we help small businesses and families um, get legal help um, conveniently online. Um, you can come to us and create legal contracts using technology. You can sign them online, you can file things, and you can get um, legal advice from lawyers. Um, so we have some of our own lawyers working for us, providing legal advice. And also we work with a network of law firms um, providing advice as well. Um, we started out about 11 years ago in San Francisco. Um, we opened up in the UK about um, seven years ago and now we're operating in a few European countries as well. Um, the premise of um, why we started out was that we you know, found in, in the US, and I think it holds true in the UK as well, and certainly in the European countries, is that most people, nearly, you know, the vast majority of people and small businesses don't actually go to lawyers to get legal help, and, th and that seemed wrong. You know, our founder was a lawyer himself, and, 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 th and that seemed wrong. And, you know, the SRA do research every couple of years on this, and um, their numbers are in about 80% of small businesses and um, families, you know, individuals, don't go to a lawyer to get legal help, and yeah, that doesn't seem right. Um, now, um, 
our, our mission, therefore, is to make the law affordable and simple, you know, a low-cost model because we want to reach those 80%. And I, I think that 80% is going to come down quite dramatically over the coming years. I think more people are going to go to lawyers to get legal help. And I think, that's being, I think that change is being accelerated by the liberalisation that the SRA um, are bringing in um, um, to the market. So I think we're going to see um, a, um, a lot of change there um, as, as um, more um, d different types of organisations enter the market and start providing legal advice. So obviously you've got tech companies already here providing legal advice, but we're going to, well, and uh, um, accountants are doing it as well, and they're setting up quite big um, law practices now. But we're going to see retailers and banks have, all, have already been dabbling around in this area as well, and insurers. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot more competition in the future, um, a, a lot of different types of organisations providing legal advice, um, which I think is good for competition. I think that's good for the customer ultimately, and I think that's why the SRA are doing what... Um, um, what they're doing. I also think because of other changes the SRA are bringing in, there's going to be a lot more lawyers practicing in the future. I, I think many times more, um, actually. Um, and those lawyers are going to have a choice about where they work. Um, they won't just have to go and work in traditional law firms, they're going to have the options to go and work in accountancy companies, tech companies. And you know, we've already hired some law firms, uh, some, some lawyers to work you know, in, in our tech company. Um, so I think law firms need to behave more like modern day companies. I think they need multidisciplinary leadership teams um, and to not just have a, 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 a partner model at the top where just the partners are in control. Um, I think they need to, with that team, I think they need to embrace technology. I think they need to embrace modern marketing practices. Um, they need to em embrace and product design, process design, and you know, and focus on customer service. And I think if they do that, um, and they redesign their organisations to be flatter and, and less hierarchical, they'll continue to attract the, you know, the the talent, and they'll continue to be successful. Thank you, Mark. That's great, um, Michelle. So, um, as uh, Ben introduced, I'm Michelle Tunney. So I'm the Legal Apprenticeship Manager for Brian Cave Leighton Paisner. Um, so I think for me, what I am seeing consistently year on year is the new um, generations that are coming into the workplace and how that is changing what we need to do. Um, I'm very pro listen from the bottom and let that message work its way up um, and I think what law firms need to focus on is process improvement, um, listening to the daily grinds of what the staff on the ground say, the people who do the day in job, um, day in day out and understanding where they feel improvements could be made. Um, and that message should be pushed up through the business. I do think the hierarchy of having your traditional law firm type partners does work in that they can be the voice for the staff um, and they should embrace that and listen to what the staff have to say. But I do think the, the recruitment rounds, which I'm now seeing, these young, passionate individuals who don't want to be just another number on a firm's book, they want to have a voice um, and they want to see that their ideas drive actually drive forward um, client relationships that they can have a say in that's not just led by the partners anymore. Um, I think they are real passionate young individuals that I'm now starting to see come through and I do think they will have a huge impact on how our law firm in particular is run. Thank you Michelle. Richard. Uh, thanks. I was building on those two points. Um, I say fundamentally I think what you've all got to do is to really start thinking about your law firm as a, as a real business that makes and sells things. So you know for, for many decades, centuries really, that the legal market has kind of seen itself as a sort of special discipline that was sort of separate from business logic, from industrialization, from economics. Uh, and that's really got to change, not even because you necessarily want it to change, because things, let's be honest, are working out pretty well. Uh, things are going to change because of expectations, client expectations are changing. The digitization of the, of the economy is moving very, very rapidly. And law is getting sucked into this, whether it likes it or not. Um, so the, the fundamental issue really is to think about how you make things. If you think of the law firm as, let's say, a factory, you're making things for the client and you're selling them. So you're making employment contracts, uh, you're doing conveyancing. And the conveyancing effectively is just shifting property from one place to another. So it's almost like a logistics task. Yeah? You're doing a, a small merger, you're doing various things. 
these are outputs, these are products. Think about how you're making them. Um, can you put a fixed fee on that? Um, can you put a fixed fee on that and protect your margins? Can you find uh, process bottlenecks? Are there parts of work that, from your point of view, really are just paralegal work or legal admin? It's not really legal work. And I think this really is, is the key second point. Uh, a lot of people get scared about thinking about their law firm in terms of economics, in terms of processes, in terms of technology, because they're scared they're going to get sucked into this world that's very foreign and alien to them. The reality is, is that the purpose of all of this is to free you from the drudgery and turn you back into real lawyers. I mean, the amount of time that you spend doing admin is ridiculous. There was a study done in America, and it made it, I'm not sure if it's the same here. They found out that the average small firm partner, so, you know, like 10, 20 lawyers, is actually doing two to three hours billable work a day. And the rest of it is stuff like chasing bills, drawing up really, really basic but monotonous contracts, which they could have automated, collecting data, which could have been automated, all kinds of stuff that, because they never get themselves together to invest in those processes and that basic technology to speed up their processes, they just get weighed down with it. And then you make less money. And because you make less money, you don't feel that you can invest. And you, end, you have this endless cycle where you, it's a very asymmetric thing, particularly for the smaller firms, because you often deal with clients who use law firms very infrequently. So they know nothing about the law, they know nothing how you work, and they come to you, and you just give them what you always do. And you don't make much money from, from working with them, and so you don't invest anything. And on and on and on the process goes. But eventually that's gonna break, because rather like with the internet and iPhones and so forth, the, the clients, or the customers, whatever you want to call them, the consumers, uh, are going to get wise to it. And then people are going to start offering, people like Rocket Lawyer, are going to get more and more efficient, more and more effective, and they're going to put you all out of business. Uh, and it'll probably, it'll be a very, very, very slow build up to a threshold. <laughs> and then it'll go snap, like that. And you'll be like, wow, that was fast. I really thought I had 10 years before I retired and moved to Tuscany, but actually I don't. I've got to sell the firm tomorrow. So uh, I think there is a burning platform. Going back to Carl's point earlier, um, there is a real burning platform, but it's very, very hard for you to see it because your punters are coming through your front door, handing over the cash that you expect them to pay. And they're none the wiser because they've never used a lawyer before. Um, but I'm sure you can see that that's not a, that's not a sustainable system, uh, not in the current um, environment. So that's my central point. Thank you. Well, there is a carrot there of freeing you from drudgery, but also a stick of you going out of business. So, um, yes. But um, if we move on to Mary, um, what are your thoughts? Hi, Van. So my main, one main takeaway would be concentrate on your people and your culture, which is something which both Michelle and Mark said. Um, from my perspective, gone are, gone are the days where you, you qualify, you, you uh, work your way up on one trajectory path to become partner and you retire as a millionaire. We're going to be working for a lot longer and millennials want different things. And by 2025, 75% of the workforce is going to be millennials. We did a survey last August and we sent it out to um, 2,000 paralegals and we got... Um, 800 replies within three hours and that's partly because they were glued to their phones so you could answer it very quickly but the one interesting point which came out of it was 65% of them said they, that they did not want to practice in one practice area forever they saw their careers as moving around and trying out different things and I think this is quite an interesting point for law firms to take on so how can you retain your talent well you can retain your talent by offering different things so I was a property litigator and actually I could see my career path and where it was going. I was going to become a rights of light specialist and it was becoming more and more niche as I did more and more of that type of work. If my law firm had said, actually, what other skills do you want to gain? Do you want to get more commercial skills? Do you want to do more project management? How can we help you do that? Can we move you into different areas of the business where you can gain those skills? I think that's how you retain your talent. Um, I also really believe that it's all becoming about your personal brand. Social media, LinkedIn, you, you post the, the, the cases you're working on, and it's all, about, it's all becoming about you. And especially with the SQE, where law students are going to be able to build their own training contracts. So they could go to ASOS for six months, they could then go to Travis Smith for six months, and they could actually qualify at the end of that by doing the SQE too. And so it's, all going, to, it's going to become very much about you and building your own career, which means that law firm culture becomes incredibly important to retain the best talent. And how do you appeal 
to the best talent where you need to change, I personally believe, change the partnership model. I think, um, I think millennials want to feel belonging. And there's a, there's a law firm called Stephen Scone, which I'm not sure if, if any of you know, but they do a profit share at the end of the year where you could be a legal secretary, you could be a junior lawyer, you could be a partner, but it's split across... John Lewis model. John Lewis model, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that, they've had the best retention rate and they've been voted as um, been the top 100 best 100 companies to work for for the past four years. And that's... I don't, I don't necessarily think it's just a millennial thing. I think it's kind of a change in time. That's what people want. They want a purpose. They want to feel excited by the mission of the law firm and they want to be a part of it. And that all comes down to, I, I, I believe, um, really belonging and, and feeling a part that you really belong to the law firm. Um, and finally, my third point would be, which is a bit of a plug for, for Flex and what we do, but law, your biggest asset are your people, but they're also your biggest overhead. So use your alumni, use your future trainees and and scale up and down your workforce as and when you need. Um, we, that's what we do with paralegals. We send in teams very quickly and we, we remove them. But I think law firms are particularly bad at using the network that they've got. People always have alumni. You have people on mat leave who might want to do a, a couple of hours a week. Uh, you have your future trainees and actually pulling that resource together and trying to manage that so you can flex up and down as and when the workload changes. Um, I see as a huge kind of a, a huge advantage. Thank you, Mary. Um, that was that was great. And I suppose I wanted to start off just exploring a bit more about the workforce of tomorrow. We covered it a bit in terms of their changing expectations of millennials, but also we talked about it earlier whether the um, solicitors of tomorrow are qualifying with the right skills and tech and data and coding are things that may may be important. What? Are, what needs to change in terms of um, how law firms operate to, 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 to manage that, do you think? And, um, yeah, and also, are apprentices, for instance, a, a good way of doing that? Has anyone got any thoughts on, on that? Um, I mean, on the, uh, the apprenticeship model, obviously, it's, it's completely different to the traditional route of qualification. And um, there are different types of apprenticeships which you can have. You can have a trailblazer, which is a six-year you're in with the firm, you do six years, um, your qualifying work experience is included in that and you sit SQE 1 and 2 and qualify. Um, we offer a slightly different model in that we do a two-year paralegal apprenticeship first and then we do the five-year solicitor apprenticeship on the basis they are successful through the paralegal model. Um, so they pass endpoint assessments with university and they um, successfully go through an internal promotion process. And something which we, we, we are really looking at at the minute and something which I'm really keen of, um, and more so now we have the US arm of the firm, is career paralegals. Um, because I think there is a huge impact that we could have in the UK, which we don't currently um, use and utilise career paralegals. Um, so for me, allowing that two year break for somebody to think, I enjoy working for the firm. I possibly don't want to continue studying immediately. Um, I enjoy law, but actually I quite like the data analyst type role of what I've done on a project, or I enjoy legal project management, or actually I really like the systems and I'd like to work in process improvement. And being able to open up as a law firm to say, OK, you like to be with us and we want that retention. So how can we then offer that progression that you would like? So not everybody will necessarily continue on the solicitor apprenticeship and go down the route to be a lawyer. And is there, you think there's an appetite for that amongst? I think so, absolutely. Because for me, it's, it fills the skill gap. It, it's recruiting people that you already have internally who understand the business and allowing individuals to explore what actually they enjoy about their job. Um, because I do think, especially if you think I recruit people straight from college, they're very young and they probably all watch suits, which I've never seen. Um, but I think there is this, it was Ali McBeal in my day. I think there's a huge kind of, you know, I want to be a lawyer or they all think it's slightly like The Apprentice. And, you know, it's, it's a huge culture shift for them going straight from college into a law firm and just allowing people to explore those avenues. And I really think it's something that I certainly would like to plug into this future paralegal career is, path. Is there a danger at the moment that perhaps firms, there's a bit of a snobbery around the paralegal role? It seemed like a lesser, a lesser lawyer. Absolutely. I think it's, there's a huge stigma around paralegal roles. Um, I previously worked with a paralegal for, who'd been a paralegal for 25 years. She was ultimately um, promoted to an associate status because she was so experienced in her area 
and you know she trained up all the MQs she trained anybody that moved in from another firm and I really do think but what we need to do in the UK is we have to have that benchmark and until the benchmark is there for people to understand they will be rewarded with a salary that it supports the knowledge they bring to the business until we're at that point I think it will be a struggle but for me a passion would be to see that happen definitely some of the rest of the panel want to come in on that point yeah, yeah, a, couple, well, a couple of points I mean building on your point I, I think one of one of the key things is actually just add um, as well as doing artificial lawyer my day job I'm a management consultant and I advise lawyers on innovation and strategy and that's how I ended up writing my blog which then became uh, all-consuming anyway the key point is that Law firms need a better understanding of division of labour. I mean, the reason why we have a modern economy is because people figured out that you need to get people to be specialised in certain tasks. And then when you put those people together, it creates a team and they all work better together. Um, I mean, for example, one firm that I know, um, medium-sized law firm outside London, they've got this whole group of people who are associates. They've been there for absolutely ages. Um, they are not on particularly good salaries. Uh, considering how long they've been classed as associates. They should really be partners by now. Um, and they're, they're pretty much holding up the progress of all the junior lawyers who want to come through, because you've just got this like mass of people in the middle there. They're not good enough to become partners because they can't win business. They're good lawyers, but they could never win a client in a million years. So they're never going to become a partner, certainly not an equity partner, because if you can't win clients, you know, you shouldn't be owning the business. Um, so what are they doing there? They're just sitting there soaking up. And also, um, I worked with this firm a few years ago, and we did an internal satisfaction survey. And they were the least happy people in the firm, unsurprisingly, because they were totally unfulfilled. They didn't know what their job was. They didn't know what their destiny was. They were confused and unhappy. Some of them had really wild expectations that they deserved huge bonuses, because they saw what people who had become partners were earning. Because like these people were not going to become partners, but people in their group had gone on to become partners, were earning like five times what they were. And they were very unhappy because they didn't know what their real role was. So basically, to sum it up, the division of labour in this firm had, had gone completely out of, out of whack. Right? So I think what you've got to do is look at yourself as a real business and go, what are the tasks that we need doing? And who are the right people to do those tasks? You know, and I, I, I agree, get away, get away from this stigma of you know, if you're not a solicitor, then you're somehow untermensch, you know, and get, don't use the term non-lawyer, you know, that's one of the first things you can do inside your, uh, your firm is stop referring to lawyers and non-lawyers, because there's nothing more that builds this sense of a chip on your shoulder than being referred to as the non-lawyer, <laughs> you know, it uh, doesn't help. So yeah, that's the key point. No, just to add to that, so... Um in Flex, we're, we're a team of 22, and we have seven paralegals. And what we do is we do a commercial development scheme, so we move them around different bits of the business. So two of them help in finance, two of them help in sales, two of them help with bookings, and two with operations, and they rotate. And I love that because they get to see every bit of the business, understand the importance of invoicing, billing, understand the importance of sending out cold emails, getting on the phone, giving good customer service and our aim is at the end we'll spit them out and they'll be better lawyers when they go and start their training contracts and I think law firms could learn from that I think letting people you don't necessarily have to be the best at finance but understanding what a P&L means and looking at it more from I think both Jeremy and Carl said this in the last session but understanding how the business is run and why it's run and why you invoice is all stuff which as lawyers we should all really um, understand and it would make us a better lawyer. I was a terrible lawyer, absolutely terrible. I had no commercial awareness whatsoever when I was practicing until I started Flex and now I completely understand the importance of billing, I know what a P&L is and your commercial awareness suddenly um, it becomes real and I think if, if maybe even as trainees we, you move your trainees around and actually get them to do a bit of a sales role, get them to do sit in finance for a bit even if it's just a few weeks here and there so they a get to know everyone in the firm b understand the business needs and actually also network so many firms have departments that don't speak to each other and actually at the junior end you can really utilize that because you can post them around so that actually they can say actually i do know Catherine in, in accounts so i'll just give her a quick call i think that's something i would love to see is building on non-lawyer skills within your law firm as you come in, just want a quick extra point. Yeah, sure. the, the bit about bottom up. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the thing uh, called Kaizen from Japan, which is which was developed at Toyota, which was this idea that anyone on the factory 
um, production lines, if they saw something that could be improved, they would hold their hand up and the whole production line would stop. And then the senior management would come down and they would talk about how they could improve it. Like even if you could improve the, the process of making the engine by five minutes, for a company like Tokyo, uh, for Toyota, that would be a huge thing. And I think that's what law firms don't do. They don't go, the, the, the senior management doesn't, doesn't go down, walk the corridors and say, how long did it take you to draw up that employment contract? You know, surely there's a better way of doing it. Do you have any ideas? I know nothing about technology, but you're a young chap or lady. You must know something about it. Um, and just feed those ideas up. And they might say, well, actually, there's a thing called Contract Express, and we can automate that contract, and we, I could produce that contract in five minutes. Mm -hmm. And because that contract is fixed fee, we're actually going to double our margins on it. I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. yeah. Our best ideas come from our paralegals, but it out, it out. <laughs> Or from the non-lawyers, as in yeah, exactly. which, um, okay, um, whether you're a lawyer or a non-lawyer, um, I'd like to try and get some questions from the floor. Um, has anyone got any questions for our panel? Yep, uh, the Flamingo's winning again. Um. What opportunities do you think the new SQUI qualification offers? Uh, I suspect Mary can answer this well, but I, I'm sure that, that there are things to be said from an apprenticeship perspective as well. What opportunities do you see there being in the breaking open of the training, training, traineeship process so, um, to bring in those business skills that we know are so badly needed? So just so everyone, who, who, if you don't know, so the SQE is the solicitor's qualifying examination. It's going to change the way solicitors qualify. It's due to come in in 2021. Um, but one of the things it does is it tries to remove the, uh, the current mode of the LPC gamble and the reliance on getting a training contract and it tries to make it easier for people to, one, earn as they learn and to develop um, their own work, work experience o over time and have more power over that. So, um, Michelle, do you want to kick off on that one? Yeah, I think... It so at the minute, there's a lot of conversations taking place internally um, around the SQE exam, how that will look. Um, what we've tried to do with the apprenticeship is streamline the apprenticeship with how our graduate entry recruits will come in. So those that are on my solicitor apprenticeship will join what we will class as the traditional trainee um, route. So all of the apprentices do a seat rotation throughout the full five years. Um, they do six month rotations in the first two years and then 12 to 18 month specific client seats um, in different departments and then the traditional training contracts of six months at a time. And what I'm finding at the minute is we're quite lucky in that we are liaising with the training providers and the training providers that are pitching for the work are coming to us to say, how do you want this model to be? What additional mod um, modules would you like to be in there that we can design around and make this a bespoke training for your firm, which is something that you wouldn't have been able to necessarily do previously. So we're currently trialling a legal tech um, module for our current training provider as part of the apprenticeship, which they're looking to build into the LPC. And it's, it's bringing those opportunities of firms being able to have an input into how they feel, well, actually, my business would really like some legal pro um, project management to be incorporated. Um, and how can we work around that to make sure that forms part of the qualifying work experience? So al although it's quite, you know, for some quite a scary time that it's such a shift in, in the traditional model, I do think you can be innovative around that and think, well, what, what do I see my current lawyers and my current trainees? What, what, what skills do they lack? And how can we get the training providers to build that into the current model? And one thing we're trying to do with the SQE is, again, there's a potential danger around apprentices that there's a potential snobbery of that seen as a lesser way of qualifying. Obviously, the SQE, by having a consistent standard at two points, means that everyone's on an equal footing in terms of once they, once they qualify, they've gone through that. Mark, did you want to have an, something yeah, to add on that? I one? think the FQE and the, you know, the individually, um, individually um, regulated solicitors, which is coming in later in the year, together is just transformative. Um, I think it's astonishing what the SRA have, have put in place here. Um, astonishing in a good or a bad in, 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 a, in, a, in an amazing <laughs> way, yeah. Um, I, think it, I think it's going to um, put England and Wales, at least, you know, um, way ahead of um, other Western, you know, um, legal systems. Um, you know, at one, one of the things we do at Rocket Law is we kind of hoover up um, paralegals who couldn't get training contracts. And they're amazingly talented people, but they just weren't quite the right fit, you know, for the law firms that they were going after. And, you know, again, the vast majority of, of graduates from the LPC don't get training contacts, um, 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 contracts and find themselves kind of like, left on the shelf in some respect. So 
that's all going to change. And they will be able to do paralegal work, you know, supervise paralegal work um, in you know, in-house, in tech companies, in, in law firms, in retailers, wherever they are. And when they're ready, and when they've got the experience that they need, they'll be able to take an exam. And when they pass, they'll then also be able to set up a company and they'll be able to start prov and providing legal advice. Um, so that is extremely transformative. And in a few years' time, we're going to see, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think probably four times as many solicitors are out there providing legal advice. And, and then suddenly, um, we are going to be able to help all those um, people who are you know, um, currently not getting access to justice. So I, I think it's extremely transformative, the SQE. Mary, and then. Yeah, another, I th another thing, I think it will really increase diversity. So at the moment, there's about 25,000 law students with 5,000 training contract places. You have to go and put yourself through the LPC, be out of pocket of t at least 20 grand when you've done the GDL and LPC, which, frankly, half the country wouldn't be able to afford, or they're coming out with such big debt and starting their careers with you know, huge amounts of debt that it's, it's quite worrying, I think. Um, so allowing this opportunity to earn as you learn, allowing more people to have an opportunity to become a solicitor, I think is only a positive thing. And I think um, the SQE sometimes gets bad press. And yes, we need to take the training very seriously and make sure people are being trained properly. And we all as lawyers and as law firms or people who has a paralegal or trainee coming to us should, should take that very seriously. But if we do, then it's a fantastic opportunity to get more good lawyers through the system, um, as, as, as Mark said. Can I, any thoughts on the SQE from in the audience or any um, further questions for our panel? Well, I'll, we'll move on to um, tech then. Um, and we discussed it in the, the previous panel. Um, and I wanted to focus on tech at the, what can the high street solicitor or somebody with not much budget to play with, what should they be thinking of in terms of tech? How should they be approaching it? Because there is a danger that it's just like, this is just for the, the big players. What, what are people's views on that? I'll kick off, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rachel is coming up in the next session. Um, when we did this last time in, in Leeds, um, made a pretty good point, which was um, law firms and all companies in general really make a, um, often make a mistake of just going for the tech. They think the tech's going to solve their problems and they see some tech and they then try and work out what, what they're going to do with it. And that is completely wrong. You know, that very rarely works and tech companies don't do that. You know, you've got to start off with you know, what customer experience you're trying to achieve, what new products you're trying to bring to market, what business goals you have. You've got to work those things out. You've got to have a vision for where you want to get to. Um, with the technology that you're going to apply. And then you need to break that vision down into lots of very, very small steps and you need to get started um, on the smallest thing you can possibly do. And I would probably advocate not even using any tech in that first step, just getting some manual processes in place, getting some spreadsheets in place, you know, and whatever it takes. Get started on your innovations. Choose something which is going to deliver benefits to, you know, to your customers and to your business pretty quickly within a few weeks and then start trying out. And you might get it wrong, so go back, try it again, correct it. And then once you've got that right, you can then start building together you know, lots of little small innovations and you can start heading towards your end goal, which you're gonna you know, do something pretty transformative for your business. That's the point when you need to start getting vendors in and you start thinking, okay, we've got this working, we can now get it better. Now let's get an IT vendor in, you know, a, a consultant in to help us get this even better and automate even more. But I would definitely um, you know, empower your staff um, you know, to hold their hand up and say, this bit isn't working, can, can we fix this a little bit? And I would definitely advocate trying to get an end vision for where you want to get to, but just break it down into really small pieces um, so you can get going. It's called agile development in the, you know, in the software development world. And you know, it can work for processes. You know, it can work for reorganizing your, um, you know, your, your organization, your products. It's a, it's a great method. I completely yeah. um, mirror that um, thought. And I think, you know, for me, every transaction has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if you can identify the key stage markers throughout a transaction, all of the bits in between, you can look and say, this part is out of scope. And actually, this part does need to stay with that level of resource. But by analysing the transactions that you have, 
and starting very basic, as you say, with something like an Excel spreadsheet or a basic Outlook calendar, just something to monitor progress of matters. When you start looking at those set kind of key stages of a transaction, it enables you to identify the right level of resource. And actually, you can find that one transaction that has traditionally been run by one person may well be a partner of the firm. Actually, that would be fantastic for somebody who is more senior paralegal or a trainee or somebody who is on the, say, for in my firm, an apprentice solicitor or even apprentice paralegal. And that's where you start to make the money and start to actually realise where then the technology can come in but you have to start with the process um, the, for me there's I, I completely agree there's no point going out and spending money on a million pound tech product where actually it's a it's a thousand pound solution that's needed um, and you have to put that work into and the time in to understand where you think that technology comes into play but again listening to the people on the ground um, we very often have, um, you know, they have partners meetings in our London office and they will come to Man our Manchester office and sit with the guys on the ground. And, and every session I hear, I've learnt more in this hour spent with the paralegals or with the associates than I have done in the last 12 months. And it's just opening up and listening to the opinions of people um, and just identifying those processes which you can start to investigate further. Richard, do you want to yeah, sure. Well, maybe the easiest way of doing this is just walk you through an example that I, I did uh, as a consultant with a, with a firm. So basically, they got very, very ex they'd been reading the legal press and everything. They got very, very excited about AI and automation, all this stuff. Um, they called me in. They said, "Right, we want to do AI." And I was like, well, "Okay, well, you know, calm, calm down a bit. What, what are we going to, what are we actually talking about here?" And they weren't really quite clear, but they knew there were big efficiency gains. They knew there were big opportunities. They weren't quite sure what they were. I said, "Look, I mean, we're walking around blind here. You know, let, let, let's try and identify what other problems we're trying to solve." So what I did, basically, um, we picked a group of people who represented all the different practice groups of the firm and including some of the professional support groups. And we went through a process, process of identifying all the <laughs> bottlenecks, all the process problems, anything that they felt was taking a lot of time or too much time. Now you might say, well, that's not very sexy, that's not very glamorous, but it was a very, very good way to start because if we could shave off 10% of the inefficiency of that law firm, they're going to be making more money because their cost base is the same, right? So if they're 10% more efficient, they're doing 10% more work, which means more revenue. Same costs, more revenue, more profits. Everybody's happy, right? So we went through it, and surprisingly, there was only one or two people really who were excited about AI and all the fancy stuff. The two things that, that really came out there was one was client onboarding and money laundering checks. Every practice group had to do their own money laundering checks, and it was driving everybody nuts. And I said, well, why don't you just have a centralized team? And this isn't a tech solution. You just get two or three PAs and a paralegal or whatever it is, and they just sit in the center of the office, and they handle everyone's work. And that's all they do. It goes back to div division of labor, right? So they become really expert at it, and they become very used to this subject. They know exactly what they're doing. And all the paralegals and the associates and the, the partners can just get on. With it. I mean, there was this one guy who was literally spending half his day running around doing money laundering checks and trying to get passports off people. And he was an equity partner. It was ridiculous. Total waste of 30 years of this guy's talent. So that's one thing. And the other thing that everybody wanted, again, was very, very, very simple. They wanted a portal where they could place documents that the clients could then come onto that portal and see. So whether it was conveyancing, whether it was a divorce, whether it was an employment contract, whatever it was, it was very simple. So I, I do my piece of, I, I draw up the contract for them, I stick it into HiQ or some other collaborative thing, I send the password privately to the client, client gets access, they can look at it, download it, sign it, send it back. Really simple stuff, but again, you know, really adds efficiency. Now, once you've settled all of that stuff and you can get into the really exciting stuff, you can start thinking, what are the contracts that our clients ask us to do again and again and again? If it's a fixed fee, why don't we look at contract automation? Yeah, and on and on and on. And then if you get very, very excited, you can start looking at AI solutions. But, you know, let's not go there now. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the approach. Just what are your problems? What are your opportunities? Automation is the low-hanging fruit. AI. Yeah. It's not for firms yeah, yeah. of our size to be doing. You know, we, we should be focusing on making our processes efficient, improving our products. Exactly. I mean, Rocket Law is a good example in the, in the, in the sense that you're, you're selling sort of standardized contracts, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, but your standardization, I mean, that's the other thing as well. I mean, you know, why do you, ha I don't know if, if any of you produce NDAs, but you know, there's like a hundred different types of NDA, it's crazy. I mean, most NDAs all do the same thing. Uh, most employment contracts all do the same thing, really, you know. Um, have you standardized, have you standardized your contract? Have you standardized your key legal clauses? Have you got a clause bank where rather than ringing up, you know, Bob or Mary saying, you know, what's, what's the clause about arbitration for employment contracts, blah, blah, blah. You just know, you just go to, you've got a central database in your office and you've got all your clauses all lined up. You know, this is Smith and Partners standard arbitration clause. We always use this for all of our employment contracts. Just drag it, cut and paste, pop it into your contracts. You know it's good, you know it's kosher because you've, done, you've been all using it, it's been approved. You know, just very, very, very simple things like that. Just, just rethinking the way that you construct your products. You know, that, that's what it all boils down to. The challenge is how do we automate Bob and Mary then? Um, in our firm? <laughs> but, but, but that's the point is, is that the, the, the dialogue, so much of the conversations about robot lawyers and all this kind of stuff, and that's like so, so like a million miles away from the, from the real stuff, isn't it? Now, I'm going to do one last plea for a question from the floor, and um, we've got a couple of minutes before finishing this session and we move on to our next session. And if there aren't any, yeah, the gentleman here, thank you. I think, I think um, all, all good questions start with, I have a friend who's got this problem. So <laughs> I've got a friend who has a, uh, Pete Harbord, um, I've got a friend who has this problem and um, uh, they're in a leadership position in a firm and it would cover many of the people in the room and they see what you see, and they understand what you see, and they go, how, do, how, uh, how does my friend get their position of their fellow partners to see the shop floor rule and understand that is an innate part of a team leader's or partner's job to encourage that shop floor up improvement in every part of the firm and getting that inbuilt into the culture in the firm? How would you go about doing that? Wants to lead on that one? Okay. Mary? So yeah. I personally think stories and examples and um, getting someone to do something and then t shouting about it. And I, the only reason I say that is almost, it's almost like with me, it was like getting investment. How am I going to? How am I going to get people to invest in this idea? And the way I went about it is by giving it a go, getting it a lot wrong. So our whole model was wrong when I started it. And I went out with spreadsheets, I got paralegals, and I actually gave it a go and proved that, yes, this, this, this is going to work. I've made X amount of revenue of me giving it a go on the side um, within a month. And I went, when, when I then went to investors and approached them, I could say, look, I've actually done this. I've given it a go. I really failed when I did this, but this worked, this worked, and this worked. And that's why this is my kind of projection. And that's, that's, um, this is where I want to go. And I think stories, giving things a go in a sandbox or testing something, get it, getting one of the employees or someone on the shop floor to, to give it a go and learn from it, say what worked, say what didn't work, and then take that up to the management team and say, actually, we've given it a go on a very small scale. This is why it worked. This didn't work. Here's an example. Here's what we've learned. Um, who else wants to, wants to try this? Presumably celebrating failure is important in that sense, because if people are worried about pointing out failures or things that haven't worked, then you're not going to work out what does work. Completely. And lawyers are so risk averse, I think. So actually saying you've done it and this is what you've learned from it is, is way more... Um, it's way more enticing to other people rather than just saying, I think we should do this. So any of the panel want to build on that? Yeah, I think I'd just agree with um, what Mary said, and especially if um, your friend is in a position of leadership where they have people working for them, um, where you can test that environment in a small scale way, um, because results will speak for themselves and being able to, to push that and say, actually, I've tried it. Yes, I may have failed in one area, but this is the overall result. I think that's the way to make people listen. Yeah, I, I agree. Just get out there and do it. <laughs> um, almost embarrass other departments you know, into doing it themselves by doing it really well, becoming an expert at it, mm. circulating the best practice, all the learnings and how well it's improving your department. And eventually, you know, the managing partner notices <laughs> this and pretty much mandates it. Um, so embarrass other, other partners in, in, into doing it by showing them how good it really is. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you to our panellists. We've run out of time now, um, but that was a really interesting discussion. So I could ask you to thank our panellists.
and we're going to move on to the last session now.